<laughs> well, hey, good morning. How's everybody doing? We good? All right. Well, Merry Christmas. Man, don't you just love all those videos? Can you give it up for Tanner, who's made those videos each week? Aren't those awesome? Yeah. So... Man, I love that. It's so good. You know you're getting old, though, when you see Macaulay Culkin's about to turn 40. So just kind of put that into perspective. Um, Only, yeah, a few years older than me. It's crazy. So you saw in that, you saw the movie uh, White Christmas. Everybody seen White Christmas? Hopefully you've seen it. It's like a classic, right? But there's also the song White Christmas that we all know. And what you may not know is that the song White Christmas is probably the most well-known Christmas song of all time, but it's the number one selling single ever, which just to me is so interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. And so it first aired during the Kraft Music Hall radio show in 1925, excuse me, uh, December 25th, 1941, which is Christmas Day. The host there, Ben Crosby, sings the song, and it's kind of this soulful, melancholy, kind of sad song, right? And what we may not realize is that just 18 days prior to that Christmas day, on December 7th, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and we now, as a country, were part of World War II. So our American soldiers are being shipped off to war, and they'd now only be able to dream of a white Christmas. And even today, we ourselves dream of our own version of a white Christmas. I know for me, my version of a white Christmas is to have all of my lights perfectly placed outside on my house, right? The mantle decorated, right, with the fireplace, above the fireplace with care, with greenery and stockings hung, right, with a beautifully decorated 12-foot Christmas tree that lights our whole home. And then at night, we can sit by the fire and we look out the window to it covered nicely with snow, right? That's our kind of picture-perfect white Christmas. But the reality is, for me, we just didn't have enough time to put any lights up at all outside. And so our house looks exactly like it did when we moved in just a couple months ago on the outside. And when I think of our mantle, well, we don't even have a mantle yet. I haven't got around to hanging it. I haven't got around to making it as there's other home priorities that have just kind of taken, taken over. And so I think of the 12 foot tree, right? We dream of the 12 foot tree. Ours instead is our tree that we had before. And it's just mounted up on a couple boxes, right? To give the appearance that it's a lot taller than it really is. And yes, I want it to snow. Now, being born and raised in Texas, my wife and I didn't grow up with kind of that idea that it would actually snow on Christmas, probably much like many of you. But after moving to Washington, D.C. 10 years ago and living there for 10 years, each Christmas we would dream of a white Christmas. And many times we actually had that reality come true. When each blizzard would come in, Meg and I would put on our winter jackets and we'd run outside with our iPhones, right? And we would kind of do our own fake news story back to our friends and family in Texas. And we'd report of the extreme conditions and kind of just make them all jealous, right? Sadly though, as you can guess it, here in Dallas, this Christmas day, when I checked last, the high would be in the 60s. So it looks like we'll have a wet Christmas, but we're not gonna have a white Christmas. So we all dream of that reality, right? Of a white Christmas, It's perfect, but inevitably something goes wrong or different. And then that plan, if we're not careful, we can be disappointed of Christmas yet again. And so today we continue our series, The Colors of Christmas. And all month long, it's been a great month as we've been lighting the Advent candle over here and just as a church family studying together the various colors represented in this Advent season. So now Advent means the arrival or the coming of someone or something significant. Clearly for believers, Christ's coming is just that, right? It's something significant. So as we've looked at the colors, we've kind of focused on three colors so far. So for review, blue, we studied blue. Blue is representing the truth that Jesus came to be our Emmanuel. He came to be God with us, right? And he is. He's with us through even the most devastating moments in our life. We looked at the color red, telling the story of redemption and the purpose of his coming, knowing that apart from the blood of Christ, we have no forgiveness of sins. 
And then finally, last week, we looked at the color green. And as green can be a sign of growth, it's in that Christ we must abide and in him that we can plant our deep roots. And so today we look at the color white. This idea that because Christ came to be our substitute, we're now completely forgiven, totally accepted, and fully loved in Christ. So if you have a Bible or smartphone, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark's the second book of the four gospels, kind of right there at the beginning of the New Testament. As you turn there, my hope is that we'll see four reasons in light of our text of why Jesus was born. And I want to try to help you personalize these because I want you to feel the weight and the wonder of why Jesus came into your life. So four things that we'll see. Jesus came to show you how to love. Jesus came to be your servant. Jesus came to die instead of you. And Jesus came to make you white as snow. Now, white can actually be a very challenging color to unpack. And there's a need to be sensitive as we talk about it, especially in our world today. For some of us, we connect the idea of white to mean nothing, maybe other than the absence of color or better, the absence of something then added, right? White can be a synonym for clean, for pure, for being without blemish. But we have to be careful here. I don't know about you, but when I look around the room, I see a room primarily of Caucasian people, white people, of which I am, right? And so I want to be careful in talking about the color white, because to someone who's not white, it can understandably come across as offensive to connect white to perfection, to flawlessness, or even, right, to a savior. So to say that white is clean and perfect, it's without blemish, and any other color is not, can be quickly misapplied if we're not careful. So now let's look at our color. So we look at our color white today, and we have to look at it in the context of Jesus who came to blot out our sin to make us pure and redeemed the white as snow. That said, let's look at our text. Mark 10, verse 35 through 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do this. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Don't you love that? They're so dumb, right? And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And he said to them, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said back to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism for which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became indignant at James and John. So picture this, right? All the disciples are sitting around and two of the twelve start to argue, who's better? Who will be more powerful? Who will be closer to Jesus? And so they go to Jesus and they ask him. And instead, Jesus burst their bubble, right? Go back to the text. He says, and Jesus called them, called them to him. So he's calling everyone together. He calls all of them to him. And he says to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So mark it in your Bible, circle it, highlight it, take a picture of it, right? Flag it on your smartphone and memorize that verse. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came to be served, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you have kids, you, you get the idea. We serve our kids, why? Because we love them. We don't serve our kids because they rule over us. We serve our kids because we love them. We would give our life up for them, right? So w when Jesus is saying here, I've come not to be served, but to serve you. I'm coming to serve you. I'm coming to show you how to love. And not only to show you, but I'm coming to be the ransom for you so that you may be redeemed back to God. 
Jesus is showing the deepest, truest form in this simple phrase. Jesus came to love, but he came to show us how to love. His life is the picture of love. So think about it. Jesus comes in every way the opposite of what the people were expecting, right? They were expecting a king. They were expecting a powerful ruler. They weren't expecting a baby to come to be born in a manger, to be poor, to have a carpenter, right, as a stepdad. That's not at all what they were expecting. Quickly look over at John 13, just two books over. And Jesus is there with his disciples in the upper room. And it says this in verse three, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He, God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is getting now down on his hands and his feet. He is being love, and he's showing them how to love. Skip down to verse 14. If I then, you, if, if I then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I've done for you. So go back to now our text in Luke. He came to serve and not to be served. He challenges the self-righteous leaders of that day and it challenges us too here today. This feels crazy, especially for, for each one of us who, hear, who are here in this room with any sort of leadership position. If that's you, if you're in a leadership position over one person or a couple people or multitudes of people, whether it's in your home or your family and work or even right here in this church, he says this to you right now. Do not lord your leadership over those you lead. Do not aggressively assert your authority over them. Jesus is saying to you, lead with love. Lead by serving. Take his example. Follow exactly how he led. So you've got the two disciples and they're arguing, who will be the greatest? Jesus comes to them and he says to them, you want to be great? Here's how you become great. Let me flip it on you. Dummies, right? You become a servant of others. You want to be great? You become the lowest of lows. Here's how you become first. You become last. You lay down your life for others. You serve. You serve how we would serve our children, right? Serve in that way. So let's look at ourselves, because we're not innocent, right? We do this too. How much do we do that today? We argue over position. We argue over being heard, over getting our way at the cost of then someone else not getting theirs. Instead, Jesus calls us to a better way. Lead, not by asserting yourself over others, but by sacrificing yourself for others. Or by sacrificing your ways to the ways of others. Jesus says, see yourself as their slave. Man, things today would look radically different, right? If leaders would lead according to these words from Jesus. I'm not just talking about our president or our government officials. I'm talking about you and me. If we led differently, how different would our city, how would our communities, how would they they look different? So Jesus is calling us to be world changers, to be the radical cause and effect for everything around us. Jesus did that. Jesus was that. He was the change agent for everyone around him. And he has been ever since. Because why? Because Jesus came not to be served. Or to put it more bluntly, Jesus came to be our servant. To be your servant. Think about that. Not just a servant, but to be your servant. It almost feels wrong hearing that, doesn't it? We preach it all the time, preach all the time that we need to serve him. And yet we can completely miss the point that Jesus actually came to serve us. Look back at the text. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. The word here for serve literally means to wait on tables. (laughs) So get this. When Jesus is looking for a word to describe why he came to you and to me, he says, I came to wait on you. That's the picture we see in John 13, and we see it back right here in Mark. Think about it. 
Today, you're probably going to go after lunch or after, after we're done here. You're going to go out to a restaurant for lunch. And someone comes to your table and they ask, how can I help you? What can I get you? How can I serve you? Jesus says, that's why I came. That's what I say to you. How can I help you? I'm your servant. Jesus says this to you. God in the flesh says this to all of us. But doesn't that almost sound blasphemous? Like it, it sounds wrong. Now let's be careful here. When we think of Jesus as our servant, we must not think of ourselves as his master. That we rule over him and that he works for us like one of our employees. He isn't a genie in a bottle here to grant our every work, wish. When we think of Jesus as our servant, we must not think of us as his master. Jesus is our shepherd, right? That's how he describes himself. He's our shepherd. We're the weak ones here and we need his help. He's not the kind of trembling servant at our table side that's there to do whatever we ask. A shepherd serves his flock. The sheep are not the master. That's crazy. A shepherd tends to their sheep. A shepherd takes care of literally kind of their every need by watching over them, by directing their paths. A shepherd leaves the 99 to what? Go after the one. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He's the master. He is the king. He is the servant who came not to be served, but to serve. And then he chooses to take the posture of a servant and to serve us because he knows that only he can serve us in the ways that we desperately need. In church, probably many of you are asking, okay, but how does Jesus serve us? How does he do that? So I'm convinced that so many Christians, we miss this in our daily lives. Think about how someone becomes a Christian. How do you become a follower of Christ? It's when we stop trying to earn God's favor like every other religion tells us we have to. Instead, we receive his grace. That's one of the ways he serves us. He gives us his grace. We are his sheep and there's nothing that we can do to earn his grace. But yet he gives it to us freely. It's at the moment when you realize that you have sin in your heart against God and that sin separates us from God, that there's no amount of good that we can do to cover over that. That is the moment we start to understand the Christian life, right? No matter how many times we go to church, we read the Bible, we pray, right? We live a moral life. We show kindness to others. We do good works. We go on and on and on. If you do all these things in your life, you still can't cover the stain of sin in your heart before God. This means that you need God to do something for you. You need God to serve you. You need God to forgive you of your sin and to free you then from that sin. And Jesus says, this is why I came, not to be served, but to serve you and to set you free. And I'm the only one that can do that. So Park Cities, get this. Every single day, we need to be set free from our sin. When you realize that only Jesus can set you free, that the chains that bind us, when we allow Jesus to set us free, to save us from our sin, then you realize that the Christian life is a life of daily then being served by him. We don't then move on from needing that. Meg and I have two daughters, Willa, who's one, and Reagan, who's three. I think I have maybe a picture of them. Willa, who's one, Reagan, who's three. I remember, there you go. So this is about, I don't know, five minutes after seeing Santa on Saturday. We didn't show you the Santa picture because you don't want to see that one. Let's just say Willa did not quite enjoy it. She wasn't ready for Santa, right? But she's still recovering here. So Willa's one, Reagan's three. And I remember when we brought Reagan, our oldest, home from the hospital for the first time. We had no idea what we were doing. Parents, you can relate, right? I can't remember... I, I can just remember how much we were panicking. How do you change a newborn's diaper? How do they sleep? Do they ever sleep, right? Many of you have been there. So here's the deal. On the first day that, that she came home, she didn't serve us at all. And now, three years later, she still doesn't really serve us very much, right? And if you're a parent of like teenagers, probably they don't serve you very much either. Like, I don't know when it starts, but... But it's the same, right? She is totally dependent on being served by us in every way. So get that picture in your mind, right? You're the one-year-old. You're the three-year-old. 
Jesus says earlier in the chapter in Mark 10, verse 15, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is Christianity. Think about it. Jesus did not come in search of servants who would help him out. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need it, right? You are the child who can't help yourself. You're like the baby coming home from the hospital. You need him in every way. And we always will. You can't live without him serving you. And everything in the Christian life depends on Jesus serving you. Everything. Think about it. What is prayer? Prayer is saying, God, I need your help. Prayer is asking God to serve us. Asking God to help us. It's asking and, and what's crazy is God tells us that that's what we're supposed to do. God actually delights in us asking him for help. He says, ask me to serve you in this way and I'll give you everything you ask in my name according to my will. Think about reading and understanding the scripture. We can't do that on our own. No, we need God's spirit to help us understand the Bible, right? To illuminate the text in our hearts. So whenever we open it, we ask God to serve us, to help us understand it. So what else do we need? We need hope, right? I know for my wife and I, we needed hope this past week. We desperately needed hope. Megan took Willa, our one-year-old, to the doctor, and the doctor gave us this huge scare, right? Willa's white blood cell count was all out of whack, and her, her spleen was swollen, and her lymph nodes, and the doctor had us completely scared by suggesting how bad this combination could be. So after being up all night with worrying and praying, we then rushed Willa the next day to get some more tests and we just find out that it really wasn't anything at all, right? But those 24 hours, we were desperate for hope. Megan and I just had to look at each other and say like, God, help us heal our daughter, right? As I'm new in this role and still learning the church and the people that make up the church, understanding the deep, deep kind of history that makes up this church, I have to pray for you. And I have to pray in this way, kind of saying to God, Lord, I cannot serve these people without you giving me the grace that I need to serve them. I can't serve them without you first serving me. And I need God to serve me all day long. And I know you do too. How about sharing your faith with others, which we're called to do every day? You and I literally cannot save a soul. We cannot save one another's souls. And yet God allows us to be part of growing his kingdom by telling others about Christ through the words and through how we model Christ to those watching and learning. We could go on and on, right? Through the many ways that Christ serves us. His mercies are new every morning. We're breathing right now, right? Our heart's beating right now. It's because of his mercy, right? It's just the Lord's kindness. There's not one of us, follower of Christ or not, who's self-sufficient. Every person in this gathering and every person on the face of the earth is ultimately God-dependent. Even if you hate God, the reality is that the very breath at this moment comes from the very one you hate. Why? Because he loves us. And this is the true meaning of Christmas. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. He came to take away the sin of the world. The word ransom in its original language refers to a payment given to release someone from slavery, to buy their freedom. Here's the picture. Each one of us are slaves to sin. Each one of us is prone to sin, which means you're prone to choose your ways over God's ways. It's like, we can't help it, right? And God knows this. Even when you realize that what God wants, what, when you realize that his way is better than your way, we still do it our way, right? We let sin control us. But Jesus came to change that. Jesus came to set us free from slavery to sin, from being captive by our sin. How? Jesus came to die instead of you. There's always a price to sin. We know this. Believers in the room, you've grown up in the church, you know Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But death wasn't always the outcome, right? Think back to Adam and Eve. It wasn't until sin entered the world that death then became our reality. Death is now inevitable for all of us because we sin. 
we die then because of sin. And it's because of that sin that we're separated from God. To complete Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is what? Eternal life. The Son of Man came to give his life. Go back to our verse. It's an interesting phrase when you think about it. When Jesus is talking about giving his life, he's literally talking about laying down his life. He's talking about his death. So what he's saying here is that he came to die. He was born to die. That's what we celebrate around at Christmas. Three times on his way to Jerusalem, he talks directly about his death. Let's look at that quickly. Take a look at Mark chapter 8. If you look at verse 31, it'll be on the screens. I'll read it for us. 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, he'll rise again. Slip another chapter over. Now look at Mark 9, 30 and 31. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he's killed, after three days, he'll rise again. Now let's go to our text, chapter 10, right? Mark 10 says this. It says, see, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man this is Jesus talking. He's talking about himself. See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they'll mock him and they'll spit on him and they'll flog him and they'll kill him. And after three days, he'll rise. He was born to die. He knew that. But thankfully, that is not how the story ends. The redemptive gospel of Jesus doesn't end with his death. No, it begins then with his death. Our Savior, who's the ultimate servant, servant knew our greatest need, and only he could fulfill it. You see, we were once enemies of God, but now we have been given new life, redemption of sin through the death, through Jesus' death and his resurrection. Isaiah 118 says this, a verse we, oh, we look at every Christmas, right? Isaiah 118 says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And this leads into our fourth and our final point. Jesus came to make you white as snow. Jesus washed your sins like scarlet away. And though they were red like crimson, now they're white as snow. They're washed away. You were once separated from God and now you're called sons and daughters of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. My goodness, we were enemies, right? And he now serves us. What love, what mercy, what grace. The things we desperately need, only Jesus could give us. Salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sin, sanctification then to walk in his ways and with him. But I know there's people in the room right now, this might not make that much sense. The idea of being completely free from sin is so foreign. And maybe it's because you haven't experienced the love of the gospel. You might not know what we mean when we say the gospel. And so Christians, your heart should leap when we hear the gospel every time because it's the good news of Christ. So here's the gospel. There's one true God who created all the world and everything in it. He created you he created me. He created all of us. And all of us have decided to turn from God's ways to our own. The Bible calls this sin. We die because of sin. And if we die separated from him, then we will experience eternal separation from God. All of his goodness, all of his love, and his grace, and his mercy. But Jesus came to change that. Jesus had lived a life that none of us could ever live, a life of perfect obedience to the Father. And then, though he had no sin, he chose to die. That's the very reason he came, to pay the price that we can't, the price that we deserve to pay. He came to be our ransom. And the good news then just keeps getting better, right? Three days later, he rose from the grave and he defeated death. And sin, so that eternal life is available to all who put their faith in him. Man, that's the gospel. That's the good news. That, if you're a non-believer, that's what we invite you to receive today, that news.
But to the Christian today, many of us who've walked with the Lord for years, we celebrate what Christ did for us, but we're still slaves to other things than Christ, right? To other things of Christ. Some of us are slaves to our anger, slaves to worry, slaves to lust, desires of all kinds of this world apart from God. We're slaves to our own selfishness and on and on and on, right? We may not think of it as slavery, but these things are controlling us. But here's more good news. Jesus didn't just die so you could be forgiven of the penalty of death, of sin's penalty. Jesus died so you could be free from the power of sin to live the life that God created you to live. Jesus came to set you free from the slavery of sin. Now, I'm not saying that we won't still struggle. My goodness, that's exactly it, right? We're still going to struggle with sin. But with his strength, when he's serving us, we then have the power to overcome it. As a follower of Christ, this causes me to respond with deep gratitude. What else can we give to Jesus this Christmas than that? Gratitude, thankfulness, to rejoice in our heart what he's done for us. And man, church, I pray that it leads us to respond with thankfulness for what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us. I pray it leads us to be servants of the gospel, to be servant leaders who love and live like Jesus. We take the very nature of a servant, right? Ultimately, though, I cause that it, I pray that this causes us to land with gratitude that Jesus pleads, he intercedes on our behalf. He serves us and he'll continue to do so until he returns for us one day soon. I'll close with this, Paul's instruction in Philippians 2 to the church says this, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but instead to the interest of others. You having the mind, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the very form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So why was Jesus born? Jesus came to show you how to love. And Jesus loves us. Jesus' love for us is so great that he desires to serve us. He chooses to take the posture of a servant. Jesus' love for us is so great that he dies instead of us. And Jesus loves us so much, loves us so much that he makes us thin white as snow. Let's pray. Oh God, we're so thankful for your love for us. Thank you for not leaving us alone in a world of hurt, in a world of pain, in a world of sorrow and grief. Thank you, Lord, for coming to earth in the form of a baby, for living a life that we can't live, for living without sin, for choosing to take up the cross and to die on our behalf. Oh, Jesus, we worship you. We thank you for that, Lord. We glorify you. We praise you as a church. We praise you as believers all around this room because you did that for us. And that's what we celebrate this Christmas. So God, I pray for each of us in here. I pray that we would know the gospel in our heart. 
Lord, that we'd apply it in every part of our lives, that we would trust you in every way. We'd see that you're pleading on our behalf. You're going before God the Father, pleading for us. Lord, to think that you, in all your glory, do that for us. Lord, may we be amazed and astonished. That's the God that came for us. We love you for that, O oh Lord. May our hearts leap with joy this Christmas season to that message, Lord. Even now we worship you in response to that. So Lord, hear our worship. Lord, may you, may you be king of our lives. May you be ruler of our hearts. May we submit our fears and our worries and our anxieties to you. May we trust you in every part of our life. So remind us this Christmas that you came to be our servant. You came to be our king. You came to serve us. We love you for that. So thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.